Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming to the Memphis Listening Lab. This is the Not Too Late Night Talk Show for Back to the Light. I'm your host, J.D. Rieger, and I've got a lot of exciting guests. And, uh, yeah, let's get to it. We're going to start with a local comedian that I recently discovered is hilarious. Let's hear it for Tylon Monger. That was a good clap for yourself there, Tylon. Thank you. Um, How's it going, man? How's it going well? How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Yeah, man. This is your first time on the show, so I got some getting to know you type stuff. There we go. So... How did you get into com- comedy? What made you want to be a stand-up? Um, so I've been doing comedy in some form or another for like over a decade. I used to uh, do a lot of stuff at um, different churches just speaking before I even knew what comedy was. Like before I even labeled myself as a comedian, I was on stage at Chuckles doing like clean comedy and stuff. But uh, one time I was uh, at the Hot Tone at this thing called Jazz Brunch. And this guy named John Miller was uh, flirting with a girl that I was sitting with. And he was telling her that he had an open mic. And I was like, uh. And I started going and I haven't stopped. So you were doing, but you were doing clean comedy before that. Mm -hmm. So that's like a whole nother world that I have no connection to. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all the same. It's really, it's really easy. Like if you performing at a church is making church people laugh is really easy. Just talk about like getting whoopings, talk about, you know, just. (laughs) Just, just healthy Southern black stuff, and, you, and you'll and you'll get a laugh. What, was was it different to transition from writing clean material to writing writing blue? What's crazy is I really never uh, wrote when I don't even remember. What, honestly, like when I when I tell people I've been doing comedy over a decade, I can't even remember what I was doing. I just would get on stage and kind of just be talking. Uh, and and fought my way through. But really, when I started uh, doing uh, dirty comedy, I wasn't even writing jokes. I was just saying things I feel. Like the first set I ever did, I still have the video of it. It was just me talking about... It was like fresh after the pandemic, and it was just me talking about how... um, nobody cared about black issues until the club was closed and and sports was off. (laughs) And um, it 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 was very uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> and I remember, oh man, I shouldn't even say it, but I'm gonna say it anyways. I remember I, I said something, and and I and I'm and I'm ashamed of it, but it was funny. Uh, I was like, "Amar Arbery's Killers Got Life," that was cool. As a white man, you know how bad you got to mess up to kill a nigga in Georgia and get life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was all like just just angst and, and the black plight when I first got, got on stage. But now I make jokes. Has your writing process evolved? Do you, I mean, do you have like an established set now or do you just get up and freestyle? No, I don't get up and freestyle at all. I should start doing that because I've recently learned um, that crowd work is the thing now. And so I, I've been, I've been stressing myself out for so long trying to be funny when I can just be like, oh, what do you do for work? Oh, hmm. And then like get a, a reaction from the audience. But you can really only do that at more uh, established shows like in Nashville. That's how they get their rocks off. It's it's egregious to see in real time, but they getting that money though. Who's the comedian that everybody loves that just does crowd crowd work? Uh it's a lot of them. Matt Wright. Oh, that's yeah, who I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you mentioned Nashville. You've been doing a lot of shows up there. You've been trying to get to Nashville a lot, I think. They got a lot of infrastructure in place. They got five comedy clubs. So I've been trying to do that three hour drive, you know what I'm saying, ingratiate myself with the people. The hardest thing about uh going to Nashville and doing comedy is just the fact that uh since they have infrastructure in place where like people can at least make minimum wage from doing comedy, most of the comedians there uh think that they are celebrities. So like comedians in Memphis, they're all sad because they're poor. <laughs> whereas whereas like people in Nashville are making like fifteen thousand a year doing comedy, so they just they 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 really feel themselves there. Wow, fifteen thousand dollars a year, mate, doing comedy. Yeah, yeah, they was talking about doing their taxes as comedians, talking about whether they should file as an LLC or independent. Those are never issues. The only things I hear comedians discussing is like anal or like <laughs> different, br- <laughs> like you know, different brands of cigarettes and stuff like that. So, what what does the Memphis comedy scene need to make it more sustainable? I mean, uh, any scene of um any any art form or any business anything you're trying to sell all it needs is more eyes on it 
because we have uh, actually Memphis has a very robust comedy scene. Yeah, there's a lot of comedians here and a lot of funny ones. There's a lot of comedians, a lot of rooms, a lot of showcases, a lot of people trying to do comedy in different forms, whether it's skits, stand up or, you know, just doing like hosting stage plays and whatnot. Um, It's just an issue with like marketing mostly. Uh, but I mean, it it it's it's get it's getting better as as we uh as we move through the year and you know more and more people start wanting to do comedy more and more people starting to want to get it out it just you have more eyes on it. Uh, how are the crowds different? Uh, like I said, like people in Memphis uh uh are poor. Memphis is a poor city, so it, so like when you're broke, ain't nothing funny. So. People like the the crowds you'll have here. If it's not, you know, like a pre-established show, uh, like like I just did. Don't tell. That's a national brand, so that was a lot easier to do than it is to do uh, different uh, random open mics. But like in Nashville, they eat up everything. Like there was people. Uh, I did Third Coast Comedy Club, and there was people in the crowd with like full suits on. Like it was like a date night for them. Like they were wearing gowns. It was like old people. You know, like a lot of old money in the room. So people, people in Memphis like will say that Memphis is one of the hard, hardest places to do comedy. But like, I don't know, like I don't know how hard it is to do comedy in Wyoming. But it definitely can feel like that. <laughs> it's probably an easy place to get, like it is in Mem- uh, for musicians. It's an easy place to get started, mm-hmm. but it's probably not super easy to make it a sustainable lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 easy to ingratiate your, your ingratiate yourself in the Memphis comedy scene. You just got to show up, like. Show show up to a couple of open mics, uh, post somebody's stuff, hang out, and like now you're booked on shows. You really don't got to be funny to get booked on a Memphis show. <laughs> like, if if you wanted to start comedy, I could get you at High Cotton Brewery with a, like a three month program of just shaking hands and kissing babies. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, you host an open mic here in Memphis, right? Yes. At the High Tone. Yes. How is hosting an open mic different from like say being on like a more pro established comedy show um i'll say hosting an open mic is uh are are you getting wing nuts like off the street coming in and just like saying whatever or are all these all like comedians trying to put together material well the the comedians are wing nuts that's a (laughs) that's 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 an important piece of the puzzle they are crazy people comedians aren't people honestly like it's and it's and it's really important that you know that because otherwise you'll be trying to like uh you'll you'll be trying to like reason with them like uh, like I recently uh had issues like I, like there was a oh my god there was a a a, a, a mass like we hate Tyler Monger train on Facebook because I didn't let one comedian skip so he was like calling people he was like oh yeah Tyler's a gatekeeper he's a is there any kids in the room he's a bitch all this whoop de whoop um and i would like i was just scrolling up like it was like people that i met one time like one guy posted a picture that he had with me and was like oh yeah this guy's a gatekeeper he's this he's that he's this so but i say all that to say uh hosting an open mic is is like being the person that uh reminds the teacher you have homework like (laughs) Like, no matter how many open mics people go to, no matter how many times they know that you have five minutes, when, you, when they get lit, they, they feel a certain way. So as far as, like, hosting an open mic versus doing a show, it's really no pressure hosting an open mic. And I'm on, and I'm, and I'm on a temp program. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm working for somebody that's working for somebody. So I just come through every day, walk a walk and, and get off stage. <laughs> I know that... Um Running a rock show is hard enough. I can't imagine trying to wrangle like ten comedians in a room with an open bar. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a trip. Yeah, it's not. It's it's really not hard at all. Like I kind of got the like like I like I said I'm on I'm just on a contract. Like I'm I'm on a ten day contract. This is kind of like um, I'm trying to think. I'm, you on a two way deal? You could go yeah, back. You could yeah. go back to the G League at any time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like this is this is a subscription basis. Like I could I could not be hosting next week, so I kind of got the reins on just the the Midtown open mic because I guess like back in the day it was P and H, and then now uh, P and H is a hookah lounge. So um, they took that audience. Uh, John Miller started the open mic at the Hot Tone, and now now I host it. So like 
as far as, you know, any sort of pressure to like build our audience or any sort of pressure to even be, cause, cause honestly, uh, and it's, and it's not a, <sighs> it's, it's not a secret. The, the, uh, the, the high tone open mic sucked for a long time. It was not fun. It was, it was, it was a very sad experience. Why like, was it not fun? Like most, cause most, cause here's the thing. Like I said, most comedians are poor. Most comedians aren't like they're, you know, drinking heavily every night, smoking cigarettes, uh, heavily, and they're not seeing the growth that they want in their comedy career. And so oftentimes that comes up on stage. Like people, it's it's crazy. People, they, they get babysitters. They they do all these things to like get be early for sign up just to go on stage and be sad. Like to go <laughs> on stage and be like, yeah, my, my grandma just died oh, and I just got my car broken into. And that's comedy for them. Um you know, question? that sounds eerily similar to, like, my last music set, only, you know, mm-hmm. with a guitar. <laughs> see, but, like, see, but with with that, the, the skill is noticed. Because if you're playing a guitar, we're like, okay, he's good at that. So, like, you can be sad. But, like, the whole thing of, like, doing comedy is making people laugh. But some, but, but for some reason, that gets, that, that, that gets missed. Like, it's not as important. Like, comedians will say, you'll hear comedians say stuff like, Oh yeah, open mics are supposed to suck. It's supposed to be grueling, but a lot of the times it's like this is the only time some people are even gonna get on a mic this week or this month. So it's it's kind of hustling backwards. But you just you know culture shifts have to happen. Uh, as I said, more and more people are starting to do comedy here. So the the biggest thing I try to do is just make it fun. Well, before I get to our next guest, I guess I'll ask you: uh, You've been dating much? Um, the the streets is weird right now. I just recently, uh, so the he, he, here's the here's the weird thing. Um, there's there's so much responsibility that goes into dating, and no one told me. Uh, cause like my granddad was a drug dealing pimp, and and he was able, he had multiple homes, and he was able to make women happy. Like he was able to you know build relationships and like. Like, like I say, he was a drug dealing pimp, like in and out of jail. But women were still like, "Nah, I think he gonna change." <laughs> like, and but but like now, like a, a woman sees like a married man like her Facebook posts, and it's like she just found the Zodiac killer. Like it's just like, oh, he he, he y'all see this? He, somebody husband on my page? Y'all y'all see this? Like, I be trying to tell my friends, I'll be like, if you have a girlfriend. And you're out here like liking people's pictures, or let alone direct messaging them. The woman that you're sending that to is screenshotting that and showing it to everybody, like our baby graduation photos. So, since since I since I know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, what's the word uh, a chauvinist, <laughs> I kind of just I, I try not to just I try to not date. You know, I, I meet a woman, I, we 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 kick it, and then I, I go I, she go about her business. Well, is there anything you, uh, we we should plug? Is that you want to plug any shows or social media stuff before uh, before we move on? Uh, just social media stuff. Like like I said, I host a uh, open mic every week at the uh, High Tone Cafe, uh, right down the street from here. Um, I have a web series on the internet called Somewhere in Memphis, um, and yeah, that is it. I don't have I don't I don't have a lot going on. Like I said, we're broke. Well, I feel you right there. Uh, l- let's hear it for comedian Tylon Monger. Tylon, you're going to hang out with us, right? Yeah, yeah hang out. All right. Uh, are we ready to go over here in the wings? In the Is wing. that a yes? All right. Our next guest has a brand new record out on Red Curtain Records. He's performing a song off of his new album, which is called Everybody Wants to Go Home. Here he is performing the song Fortune, Cheyenne Mars. Ready for a song? That's what I'm talking about. Sounds like a rock show to me. Sounds like a rock show? Y'all acting like it's an open mic comedy night or something. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I know. Said you go where no one would go. 
you knew everything Come on over. Come on. I was invited to the couch. Yeah. <laughs> Please. So, Cheyenne. Yes. Uh, tell me, uh, you've got this new solo record out, Everybody Wants to Go Home. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, why did you want to make a solo record and not like a, another band record with yeah. Spacer or, or, or a new project? Um, I think it just had a lot of... You know what? I mean, at first I went to go record with a friend and we were just going to record a couple songs because... Uh, Graham Winchester, he was recording like a solo record too, and he was using one mic on everything. And Spacer played a show with Turnstiles, his band. And uh, I don't know, he talked about talked about this one mic aspect, and I liked the sound of that, and I wanted to try it. And we were just going to record like a song or two, and ended up just making a whole record. It just felt right, just going over there after work and like you know late at night, and just making this what became "Everybody Wants to Go Home." And I was going through, like, yeah, a lot of stuff. And, uh, yeah, it just felt like the right thing to do. It was kind of accidental. But, yeah. And uh, who who helped make it besides Graham? Uh, Scott uh, McEwen at Memphis Magnetic did the mastering for it. And, I mean, I played 
everything on it. Graham played a couple like songs when we did like a live take of some drums and stuff. But I would just go in and and record drums, and we would build from that and stuff. And I think that's a thing too. Like Neil, the drummer in Spacer, he had just moved to Shreveport, Louisiana, and uh, I was kind of you know bummed out because we weren't playing as many shows and stuff. And but you guys are still a band, right? Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. We're just kind of on a little hiatus, and you know. Uh, Till it feels right to come together, and I think that's the next thing we'll do is make a record. And yeah, Scott McEwen at at Memphis Magnetic and the Red Curtain Records label has been a, a huge hand in it too, man. Because how did know, he get involved? You know, <laughs> it felt like a movie. Uh, I went to Otherlands um, and was having a coffee, and a friend of mine was out there and showing me some music. He wanted to show me some music he had been making on his laptop, and. I was like, well, let me show you some of mine, man. And, like, showed, like, showed him a song that we had been working on. The guy next to me, I swear, I thought it was Ryan Adams, but it ended up being Patrick Carey. And he's like, he, he was like, because uh, he was in, like, a, you know, Canadian tuxedo. And he just looked like him. I was like, holy shit. And, but anyway, it's like, hey, I like that. Um, I like that music a lot. And what is it? And I told him. And he messaged me. I guess we had already followed each other, but he messaged me about the label they had started and want, you know, wanted to know if I had a home for it and I didn't. So I was like, yeah, let's go. That's cool. And yeah. when did the record come out? Um, August of the vinyl was out August of this year, but the record was out on all streaming platforms like a year ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. It's been out that long. I know it doesn't feel like it, but yeah. Well, how do you feel? I mean, I guess the record it's, you know, been finished for at least a year. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about it? You know, looking back, are you happy with the end result? Yeah, absolutely. It's weird how, and just songs in general, and I mean, I'm sure other songwriters in the room can agree, like, it's weird how you make this thing, it's weird how quickly that record started to feel like a record, because like, I've had songs where it just feels like a batch of songs, and I don't know, it came into, it like started to form what became the record and now like even the title of it means something completely different to me than it meant while making it and like just like the concept of home because i literally when i made that record i wanted to be home all the time and uh one of the lyrics of the songs my fiance anna she is like was like oh, we were gonna go with a different name which I'm so glad we didn't go with, but she was like, you should name it that. It's like the, the line of one of the, your songs. It makes sense. And I was like, yeah, it kind of, it was perfect. And, you know, then I just really wanted to be home all the time. I was kind of depressed and whatever. But now <clears throat> it's like through like some like there, I've, I've been doing some therapy and stuff <laughs> and uh, home, like the, it, it's become another whole concept of something that I don't even know. Like it's, it's like just a, a feeling like more than an actual place and uh yeah I, I love i love what it is i love i love i love it yeah you know i've had that happen to me you know several times where a song or a line from a song can can change meaning on you does does that ever happen in comedy huh <laughs> <laughs> this is see, i was trying to make this a panel <laughs> tylon zoning out over there i had my eyes on the ball i was over here <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> cool. Uh, Cheyenne, you, you told me uh, that you're also working on a, some kind of Halloween EP, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was kind of like a week ago. <laughs> I had these songs, and they don't really have – they're like mainly riffs and like little melodic things – and they have a not creepy, but like just the eeriness to them. And I've, I was, you know, I'm always thinking about like Christmas songs and stuff like that. And I was just like, you know, I love, love Halloween. Like it's my favorite thing in the world. And I was talking to Scott and I was like, man, I wish we would have started, like, we could have made a Halloween EP or something. He was like, let's do it. And I was like, oh shit. I didn't think he was going to say that. And you guys got to hustle. It's almost Halloween. <laughs> and he wants to say, he was like, we should put it out a week before. And I'm like, oh God. So it's going to be like, there's going to be, like, a couple songs on it that are songs, but, like, I think a few of them will be, like, more, like, soundscape kind of things. And I want to, like, I've been asking around, like, about eerie instruments, and I picked up from Graham Burke's a, a, a theremin. And I don't know, just trying to get some stuff together and, you know, see what it becomes. But I think we'll get it done, and it'll be what it is. 
Well, that's cool. I'll be looking for that. Anything yeah. else you need to plug before we go? Uh, I'm playing uh, Writers in the Round this Tuesday at the high. I mean, podcast probably won't be out in time for uh, Tuesday. Oh, uh, shoot. Well, never yeah, yeah. mind. I mean, you know, it's not real. I don't want to put too much pressure no, no, on no, my engineer Eric here. Yeah, no, that's just a little quick. Cool. <laughs> Mainly, I mean, it's a three besides, camera shoot. Besides that, just focusing on writing and stuff. Yeah, R- writing the next record, man. Did uh, did any of what Talon was saying about local comedians seeming sad and broke any of that ring true for you? Uh, as a when he was done, I wanted to blow my brains out. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> Man, I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm rich as fuck. That sucks for comedians because I'm like rolling in the dough. Hey. Yeah. Do not you, really. Uh, do you, that do was you, a joke. <laughs> we have two comedians here. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to plug your socials, man? Uh, what is it? Music from Mars on <laughs> oh, yeah. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Music from Mars on Instagram. That's it right now. Cool. Well, let's hear it for <laughs> the man, Cheyenne Mars. Uh, coming up next, Tylen, you've you've been a you look like a competitor and champion even. Like, uh, we've got a special you look like challenge coming up. Do you have a favorite going into this? Do I have a favorite in this competition? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want the white woman to win. <laughs> That's a very Good diplomatic answer. answer. Yeah. All right, coming answer. to the stage for our special you look like challenge. First is the host and founder of You Look Like, Katrina Coleman. Uh, Katrina, uh, you look like it's a live show every third Saturday at the High Tone, correct? Yes. And it's also a podcast on the Back to the Light Network now. Yeah, have you heard of those guys? I have. What's that? Like They're nice. Thanks for, uh, thanks for bringing the show to the <laughs> network. Uh, what, what made you want to do the show again? Well, I always wanted to do the show. We had to stop for obvious reasons. Uh, there was like a thing that happened in the whole world, and I didn't want to gather people together. Uh, but, and then the PNH shut down, which is where it lived before, like you were talking about. Uh, but I had to find a new place. It took me a little while to get my feet back under me. It is uh, a bigger production, I think, than I remembered that it was. But uh, it's my favorite game. And I love to play it. I love to watch it. It makes me happy. Like, when people come and see it, of course, I love that. But it's all selfish. Like, I would do it every month. It was just me standing in the back going, <laughs> yeah, you go in. <laughs> yeah, like that one. Well, speaking of you, look like we have competition for you here. Uh, Allison MacArthur, please come to the stage. <laughs> Allison, Allison has a podcast also, uh, Loudmouth of the South, also on the Back to the Light Network. Yeah. And you also have a live show, which is every third Friday, the night before Katrina's show. Yes. Unless... We don't need your input, Katrina. <laughs> it's not every third Friday. It's every Friday before the third Saturday, which means We've it's going to be every third sure. Friday until February. Right. Because people can understand that. We've already Listen, had this argument about three times. It's okay. I'm committed to accuracy. Right. Is, is, there so, is there a special connection between the two shows? I mean, considering you're both on yes. the network and you're, you know... Back-to-back nights, do you feel a special kinship with each other? Does that make this upcoming challenge all the more difficult? Oh, definitely. Uh, Well, So my show features the stand-up of the people who are going to be on You Look Like the next night because they don't get to perform stand-up, and so they can come to the High Tone Small Room uh, and perform stand-up on the third Friday of every month, almost. Until February. (laughs) Well, And also March because February has 28 days. Uh, Katrina, should should we explain the concept here of you look like a little bit? Uh, I always say about the show, it's a little bit like Legos. I could use a thousand words to describe it. Uh, but when you watch it, it just clicks. Uh, oh, I know it's dumb. I've been doing it for many years. But uh, it's an entire show built around one joke, and that joke is simply telling someone what they look like. So it is talking about someone. It's writing a joke about someone, but based on like visual... Like, uh, hold on, did you just walk in front of the cameras <laughs> to go get your drink? I'm sorry. That is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I didn't, uh, no, no. I didn't like, think about You look it. like you yeah, forgot yeah, this was wasn't just a, a sound thing. format. My favorite just part. straight in front of the cameras he, while he, someone was talking. He ducked, but not I'm under sorry. the camera. I, 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 
I'm going to be honest. I didn't know there was even a camera. I thought this was just a podcast. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, pod- I really didn't know that. Pod- podcasts are, are, are visual now, too. I don't know if you knew that. To be fair, Shit. it was for Starbies. No, you had to okay. go get a Starbies, and like sometimes Starbies, you've got to have it. The it's thing okay. down there. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn things over to Katrina and Allison for one round of You Look Like. Take it away, ladies. Do you have uh, Oh, yeah. All right, so usually when we do this live, there's six contenders, and uh, we have a timer, which I don't know if you guys can see. It's going to be five minutes, and we'll just go back and forth. Uh, Allison, since, you know, would you like a choice? Would you like to go first? You want to flip a coin? We'll flip a coin, or I don't care. Uh, do you want Do you so want to go, go first or not? Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, and then we'll just trade jokes back and forth. We're going to trade these jokes for five minutes, and then uh, you folks in the room will... Tell us which ones you like better. And uh, then yeah, I've got we a will have a device to rights. measure your applause. For the record, Alice and I are actually really good friends. And I hope that and she's done this hundreds more times than I have. End today. Yes. I'm playing. Listen. <laughs> All right. So, normally in the live show, there's a big old to do. And uh, you guys get to count us off. So, in three. There's seven okay. of you. I can see you. I can tell if you're like three, two, one. You look like the top general in the war on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you look like your therapist doesn't like you. You look like you go to bars just to emasculate men for their drink orders. That sounds fun. Uh, you look like you haven't had an age appropriate boyfriend since 2007. You look like you go to bars to emasculate men for their taste in music. (laughs) You look like the teacher that gives the kids beer. You look like you go to bars just to emasculate men for their (laughs) hairstyles. (laughs) I told you we were friends. She knows me. Uh, You look like you've cried to get out of a ticket. You look like you just go to bars to emasculate men. (laughs) (laughs) You look like crying didn't get you out of being busted for shoplifting at Target. (laughs) Man, that's accurate. Um, You you look like you're way too proud of shaving with a Swiss Army knife. (laughs) (laughs) You look like you call it (laughs) Target. You look like you spend weekends trying to be friends with all the Home Depot employees. (laughs) I want them to respect me. (laughs) You look like you didn't cry when your husband left, though. Uh. You look like you're not sure... (laughs) Uh, Whether to refuse asking for directions or just hit the curb. (laughs) (laughs) You look like you've been in a fist fight over a Stanley Cup. (laughs) You look like threatening fisticuffs is the only way you know how to flirt. (laughs) It means something different. You look like your second DUI went viral on the internet. (laughs) You look like you're way too proud of knowing the words to chicken head. (laughs) But even prouder of how long you pause when they say the (laughs) (laughs) N-word. You look like when you sing along to that song, you definitely say it. (laughs) (laughs) You look like the lunch lady who either gave all the food away or stole the money out of the register. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You look like the girls won't take you on the Mardi Gras trip anymore because you kept flashing cops. You look like you brag about your two-knuckle pitching technique, but (laughs) not in softball. (laughs) Lady. You look like you have a Coles card. (laughs) You look like you know the dimensions of the backseat of every model of Subaru since 1999. (laughs) That's very specific. You look like you're about to ask the DJ if he's got any Miranda Lambert. You look like the only thing your stepdad and you bonded over was softball and farting contests. (laughs) It was bull riding and wrestling. (laughs) You look like you definitely call a 12-year-old a bitch. (laughs) In therapy. (laughs) Um, You look like you lost your virginity at your homeschool prom. (laughs) You look like when you sexy talk in bed, you call it your thingy. (laughs) Baby, let me touch your thingy. You look like you named your vibrator after your favorite monster truck. <laughs> Grave digger. <laughs> we wrote some of the same jokes about each other. <laughs> you look like uh, within the last six weeks you've heard someone say, Allison, put your titties away. 
my shirt buttoned. Um, <laughs> you look like the barista who either messed up the coffee or the customer that's going to yell at the manager. <laughs> Uh, you look like if Live, Laugh, Love could put on lipstick. Aww. You, uh, you look like the only thing you bring to Thanksgiving dinner is your problems. <laughs> <laughs> because you forgot the napkins they asked you to bring. You look like you're going to be super excited to show me that your jeans are kind of stretchy and so comfy. Um, you look like you're still pissed about losing both your crocheted pussy hats. <laughs> You look like you're about to DM me about a uh, multi-level marketing scam. Um, you look like you forced your kids to listen to the gender-neutral birds and the bees way too young. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you tell people you were in theater, but they don't know that that stage had a pole on it. <laughs> Man, I was a fat kid. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, you look like you can't remember how many times you've said, that was the last dick I'm going to suck. <laughs> This is personal now. All right, fine. You look like you're about to call in an vo- uh, ordinance violation on a neighbor. You look like you only wear makeup when you go home for funerals to impress your high school friends. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you touch black women's hair without permission. Oh. Only when I was young. Four, you, look, three, you look like you give toothy two. head on purpose. Whoa. You look like you have IBS. <laughs> Okay. Let's hear it for both competitors, Katrina and Allison. I think this is going to be tighter than we originally anticipated here. Um, I love so, so the way this usually goes is that Katrina would stick her hand over the two competitors and gauge the audience reaction. But since Katrina is one of the competitors, I'll be watching your reaction here. So uh, we'll start with the challenger, I guess. We're looking at Allison as the challenger. If you think Allison won this round of You Look Like, clap now. All right, and if you think Katrina won, let's hear it. You guys are scared that you're going to hurt our feelings. <laughs> okay, I, we're comics. They're all so scarred and destroyed. You can't do anything to us that our daddy issues haven't done already. So d- do you want to accept the results, or do you want to let them vote one more time? Because by a smidge, I can make a call, or we can let them clap. If you really want to make... A, a, a clearer distinction. Or we could just show, have a baby. slap fight. <laughs> Again. I would definitely lose that. <laughs> <laughs> no, right, we I'll, have slap fights, everybody wins. I'm gonna what, is, what was it? By 0.5 decibels, the winner. And still, you look like champion Katrina Coleman. Let's hear it. <laughs> I'm glad because my ego wouldn't be able to take it. I can't run the show if. I don't think a therapist should win. You look like I am an actual therapist. That's my job. <laughs> no, you should be able to read people well, for sure. Yeah, maybe it's an ethical violation, though. <laughs> well, you didn't mention my daddy issues, but That's I'm sure there's true. some jokes in there about it. You just skipped over out of a like, hip- Hippocratic oath. Because you just have a stepdad. Uh, Katrina, Allison. You okay, want- yeah, that was really subtle. I don't know my father. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Do you guys want to plug some social medias or anything we haven't mentioned? I know we've already mentioned both of your shows and podcasts, so I think we've done that. Um, I'm Allison MacArthur Comedy on Facebook, and uh, it's actually AllieMac.80 on Instagram, but Austin MacArthur everywhere. Yep, and I'm Katrina Coleman everywhere. You look like is my baby. How do you say your oh, Instagram name? Actually. How do I say it? All right, this is going to be stupid, and I promise I won't take completely over. My Instagram name is Echidna Dearest. Uh, if you guys know anything about Greek mythology, Echidna was the mother of all monsters. And if you've met my children, hmm. I'm certainly the mother of two. So it's a mommy dearest joke and a Greek mythology joke. And maybe this is why sometimes uh, when I do stand-up, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Sounds gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, folks. Exactly. I, 
I think on that note, we have we have done a podcast. I want to thank one more time to my guest. Oh, wait, Allison. I want to plug one more thing. You want to do one more thing? Yes. I also host shows in Jonesboro, Arkansas under the uh, NEA Comedian's name. I just moved here from Jonesboro a few months ago, and so we have shows there. I host an open mic the first Sunday of every month, and we have shows uh, the third Friday of um, the second Friday of the month, actually. And Mo Alexander is headlining my November show. So <coughs> He's a funny guy. Right. Yep. All right. Well, let's hear it for my guest, Cheyenne Mars. Tylon Monger, Katrina Coleman, Thank you for having us. Allison MacArthur. Thank you to Engineer Eric, Engineer Cormac. Thanks to the Memphis Listening Lab for having us. Thank you, JD. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care, y'all.